Okay. <clears throat> Welcome everybody to the uh, to the webinar. Um, hold on a second. There we go. Uh, before I start, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a, a brief introduction, you know, to the Tower Tech uh, cooling tower part of it. Um, TEC became the reps for top for uh, Tower Tech approximately. I'm going to say about six six plus months ago. Um, one of the projects we were working with was uh, Christ Hospital where we were selling the chillers and then the towers were being sold to the hospital and then we kind of introduced ourselves to them and then that's how the both parties met and it was intriguing to me because we've always sold chillers and out of out of TEC and we consider ourselves experts in you know, getting the most efficiency out of a chiller plant but incorporating the cooling towers into that was, was very intriguing to me. So that's really why um, part of the reason why we took on the Tower Tech uh, cooling tower line. So really today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the, the evolution, the valuation of, the, of cooling towers. And we're going to show you how uh, the Tower Tech tower can save up to 40% on energy over a traditional cooling tower. So. <clears throat> So when you look at the next picture, and I'm just going to briefly kind of walk through the tower quickly before I get into the actual presentation, uh, the tower looks different from traditional towers. And one of the things you could notice here is a traditional tower, it's like basically turning the traditional tower upside down. Okay? We have our water that's going to be entering into the top of the tower itself and then feeding the fill. And then as it goes down the fill, it goes into a unique piece, what we call our water collection system, which is... Uh, which is shown right here. So the water flows down into the water collection system and then goes into the high velocity basin, which is in the next piece, which you show there. Um, so in that high velocity basin, the water flows to that high velocity basin at about five, feet per, five, five to seven feet per second. One of the key things you'll notice in this cooling tower is there are no mechanicals that, that basically are touching the air. I mean, well, the air on the inlet is, but there's no, there's no mechanicals that basically have treated water that's, that's hitting the mechanicals in this unit. So uh, we're going to discuss this more in detail as we go on. <clears throat> so the evolution of the cooling tower we're going to review. We're going to look at historical evaluation of cooling towers, common operational challenges and best practices. And then we're going to talk about the efficiency advantages of the Tower Tech cooling tower. And then we're going to talk about how to specify and purchase a cooling tower based on return on investment. Oftentimes, that has never been done and has hasn't been done in the past. From a technological standpoint, um, if you look at what has happened with cooling towers over, say, the last uh, you know 20 to 30 years, um, there has been enhancement on the fill, which is on the upper left-hand corner. Um, that has that has basically changed and made the cooling towers more efficient. Um, then you've had the different materials. We have a pultruded fiberglass, which is in the top middle, or a stainless steel, and stainless steel on the side. The big thing is obviously VFDs. Uh, and VFDs, I think for the most part, has been a standard practice for most engineers and end users. And in the middle on the bottom is a davit arm. And the davit arm, really, if you look and you look at a traditional cooling tower that has the fan on the top of it, the davit arm is really used for service to make sure that if there is a problem with that motor or gear uh, system, you could take it out and you could and you could you you could you can remove that motor uh, fairly fairly easily. And then the last picture, which is the nozzles that are distributing the water over the fill, and we're going to have a lot of conversation about the nozzle part of it. So if you look at the next slide and you look at traditional cooling towers out there in the marketplace, it's very tough to tell the difference between the major three competitors out there. They all have the fans on the top, you know, and then they have the either cross-flow or counter-flow cooling towers, but they all look very similar. The one thing you're going to find unique with the Tower Tech design is, as you can see here, it's, it's very unique. Uh, there's nobody really like it in the marketplace of cooling towers um, because they have, you know, they have multiple fans on the system, uh, and you'll notice there there's actually zero water that gets exposed to, to the outdoor atmosphere. And we're going to go through that in detail. If we look at the historical evaluation of, uh, of cooling towers, um, first criteria from an energy standpoint, everybody said, okay, let's look at the installed fan horsepower of, a, uh, of the system. If I can install the lowest horsepower to do the work, that means I have a pretty efficient cooling tower, which they thought that was a, that was a good way to do the evaluation. Uh, next thing is looking at the footprint. Does the tower actually foot, fit in that correct space from a footprint standpoint? And then, of course, the last piece, which is probably the most important piece when we look at cooling towers, is 
who has the lowest cost? And when you look at all those three things, it typically doesn't match up with what we talked today about today's challenges. So the t challenges in today when we're dealing with uh, folks in cooling towers is we have, um, you know, we have airborne dirt in winter operation. Uh, low noise is a criteria. Um, alternate water sources or water conservation, which I think is going to be a big focus here, and, and you're going to see that happening in Chicago. It's a big focus right now out in California on Title 21, Title, Title 21, 24, 21, 21, I think, sorry. Uh, the structural corrosion and life expectancy, and then, of course, the big one, which is Legionnaire's disease, which oftentimes are are hand-in-hand -hand with cooling towers, and then we'll talk about maintenance and reliability. And oftentimes, <clears throat> when we evaluate installed horsepower footprint and lowest cost, it does not address today's challenges. So obviously, it does not fit with uh, today's challenges. So first thing we're going to look at is airborne dirt and winter operation. And uh, problem when I have dirt that obviously enters into a cooling tower, and you look at a cooling tower and say you see it on the side of a road, it's just basically a big air scrubber, right? So I'm basically sucking in all the dirt from the environment. It's then going through that uh, through that fill, and then it's then entering into our chiller through the condenser tubes, and the dirtier the water, the basically the 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 more uh, the more fouling you have on your condenser tubes, the more fouling I have my condenser tubes, the less efficient the chiller is, um, the more cleaning we have to do in the towers. Uh, so I have increased maintenance and I have less thermal performance in my overall chiller plant. So those are big things and big criteria when we look at uh, uh, cooling towers and how we analyze them. So when we look at the conventional approach of cooling towers, um, how do they deal with it? And that is uh, it's more frequent cleaning. You know, when you look at more frequent cleaning and you talk to end users and ask them how often do they clean their tool and cooling towers, and my guess it's not very often because most of the time people don't want to step inside of a of a, of a cooling tower, right? You got a lot of bio growth in there, uh, chemicals in there. It's it's not a fun place to be in, right? So they put in basin sweeper systems. Uh, um, yeah, they put in larger filtration systems, and then for winter operation, what they're doing is they're reversing the fans. On the on the tower tech approach, you can see there, the air is basically brought through the bottom of the fan and then discharged to the top of the of the cooling tower. Okay, so it's going to bring in less dirt. Into that, into that, into that, into that fan, and uh, from a winter operation, it helps out quite a bit, right? And then, so this is a this is a real big selling point. Like let's say when we have offices in in, in the, uh, I know it's a big. In, this is, doesn't address a lot of the stuff that's going on in Chicago, but in the Middle East, this is a big piece where we have sand in the environment, so we're not sucking the sand into the cooling tower. What they're finding is the tower tech towers uh, require less maintenance, and the condenser tubes are typically cleaner when you have a tower tech tower versus a, a conventional cooling tower. Uh, talk about noise. So that's obviously a criteria, I think, in most, in most places when we talk about any mechanical equipment. Um, in the conventional approach is using low noise fans, but when we lose, use low noise fans, that may impact your CTI uh, certification, um, intake and discharge attenuation, uh, VFD controls, water silencers, and parapet walls. And what we do with the tower tech standpoint is because the unit is a little more aesthetically pleasing than a typical cooling tower, um, they can we can put in some lattice on the side on the on the inlets of the cooling tower itself, and you can look at those two pictures and you say, listen, that one that one cooling tower is a real eyesore. It's just a big galvanized sheet metal enclosure, and you're and it's sitting right next to the tower tech tower, which actually looks pretty decent and more aesthetically pleasing. Um, so we can address the low noise issue a little bit better than a conventional tower system can. Uh, water conservation, and I think this is one of the things that you look at, especially in the, what's going to be happening in the city of Chicago. Um, one, of the, one of the criteria they're trying to do is water conservation. So if we look at a thousand ton average load of a chiller plant operating six months a year, it is going to use 10 million gallons of water per year. Okay, so again, here's the here's it, 1,000 ton average for six months is going to use 10 million gallons of water per year for that cooling tower. Okay, if I say 10%, that's 1 million gallons saved. Okay, that's pretty pretty significant. And then when we look at the other ways that we use to save water, uh, which is one of the things they're doing in California, is they're using the treated sewage water affluent 
for toilets and cooling towers. Well, that treated sewage water affluent is rich in potassium, okay? And in the potassium, what it does is when you have that, when you have that water and the condensate going on your mechanicals, because a conventional cooling tower, the mechanicals are in that stream, so you have condensate. And then it gets and sticks on there, okay, after and the condensate's on there, and it wears over time, all right? So that's, that's a big thing. And the one, one benefit of, of the tower tech design is that really there's no exposed water to sunlight on a tower tech tower. And that's really how all the algicides grow is when they have sunlight and water, and that's how you get the algicides, where you don't experience that in a tower tech tower. Okay? So another thing that they're doing is you're seeing water softeners being used to reduce water, con to save water by increasing the cycles of concentration. And when you use a water softener, what happens is my pH in the water rises. And as the pH water in the rises, it, it can affect, again, the mechanicals in the, in the airstream. So now I have condensate, again, in the mechanicals, so it, again, reduces life of that, of that traditional cooling tower itself. Um, the tower tech design, this is pretty unique because, obviously, again, we have our mechanicals on the bottom of the, of, of the tower itself. Okay, I have a high-velocity basin, which is moving at 5 to 7 feet per second. My exterior is a heavy-duty protruded fiberglass reinforced uh, uh, a fiberglass uh, casing. Okay, I have industry-leading drift emissions okay, of 0.004% drift emissions off the top of the tower. And then we have a high discharge footprint area. So one of the things, if you walk across and you walk by a traditional cooling tower, you'll notice as you're walking by it, you'll feel the driplets of the water on the side of you as you're walking by the cooling tower. On a tower tech tower, you won't experience the drift, the driplets. Okay? And one of the, one of the reasons is, is because if you look at the discharge area, my fan is on the bottom, right? So as that air is coming across the fan, the fan is basically blowing that air up. It's got a high discharge area. So it's got a, it's got a lower velocity on the discharge than a traditional tower, which has the fan in the middle, so it's a high velocity point. And then I have my, uh, uh, my drift emissions, which on a, on a conventional tower is 0.001 to 0.002 where the drift emissions on a tower tech tower is triple oh four. So I'm not going to experience the driplets because I'm running at less velocity uh, and I'm going to save a little bit of, of water there. Not a significant amount, um, but it's going to be more of a nuisance issue, the fact that I don't have drift on the side of the cooling towers. And one of the big things when we talk about drift is where does those where do those droplets go? Oftentimes you see a cooling tower sometimes on the on, on the same side of a building as an outdoor air intake and do the droplets go into that outside air intake. So that's a, that's a big piece when we're looking at it. Materials and life expectancy, chemical treatment, hard waters, uh, and again, manufacturers, they're, making, they're trying to make a cost-effective cooling tower, right? So, so that's what they're trying to do. They're, they're in that market to have the lowest uh, dollar per ton at that horsepower or that tonnage from a cooling tower standpoint. So when we look at a common approach, when we look at a, a cooling tower, they're, they're, maybe what they're trying to say is, like, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to use a galvanized tower and we're going to use a stainless steel basin. Well, at that point, I have dissimilar metals, right? I have a galvanized sheet metal outside and I have a, a stainless steel basin. I have galvanic cor corrosion going on there uh, between the two dissimilar metals. Um, I have a five-year structure parts warranty is what they're, is what they're offering. And they have a typical life expectancy of 15 to 20 years. And then if you have you know, poor water treatment uh, or poor water quality, you could be looking at 8 to 10 years in some cases. Now, the Tower Tech Tower is made of a poultry-rooted fiber-reinforced polymer. It's got a 15-year structure warranty, parts and labor. So it's a 15-year structure warranty, parts and labor. And it's got a tower expect life expectancy of 35 years. So why is this important? Because oftentimes when we're replacing the tower on a new project, uh, we're also replacing the chillers. Well, when we, when we sell a chiller, uh, per ash rate, its life is 25 years, but that end user is expecting to get 30 years of life out of that chiller. Right? So a traditional tower would have to be replaced two times in the life of that, uh, in the life of that chiller if it's lasting 15 years. Right? So the Tower Tech Tower is going to match up with the timeline of a traditional carrier chiller. Uh, so when we're doing life cycle analysis, this has to be taken into account that that tower will have to replace maybe one time for sure, but maybe even twice. 
So let's go to question number one. All right, our first question um, is how much water does a typical 1,000 ton cooling tower use in six months? The choices are 1 million gallons, 2 million, 5 million, and 10 million. So go ahead and, and check your answer there. We'll give Mike a little, uh, little breather while you guys are checking your answers, and then we'll show you guys the results. Like most people voted, we'll give it 10 seconds. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the, the voting right now. All right, let me put the answers up on the screen for you there. So there's, there's the results. 15% um, of the people said 1 million. 23% said 5 million, and then 62% of you guys had the correct answer, which is 10 million gallons of water are used in about a six-month uh, cooling tower. And obviously, if you're running your cooling tower year-round, then the answer is going to be closer to 20 million. Uh, but 10 million was the correct answer. All right, back so to you there, Mike. You could see why water conservation is such a big, big, is a big deal when we talk about cooling towers because that cooling tower is using so much water. So if I could do a couple of things, right? If I could increase my cycles of concentration and if I could uh, if find ways to save more or if I can use the treated sewage affluent uh, uh, for, uh, for the cooling tower, those are big ways that we can do water conservation. And that's why a tower tech tower makes a lot of sense when we're doing that because we can increase our cycles of concentration by up to 50% over a traditional cooling tower because a lot of things we mentioned before that I don't have exposed water to sunlight um, and I have a high velocity uh, water basin and running, running water at five to seven feet per second. So uh, let's talk about one of the big things when we talk about cooling towers, which is Legionella, okay? Well, it grows in the cooling tower basin. And the reason why it goes in the cooling tower basin is because oftentimes that's stagnant water that's in there, right? So then we have, uh, you have areas for it to grow. Um, so it's typically transmitted through drift emissions. And if you start, recall earlier when we were talking about drift emissions, Tower Tech has about 80 to 90 percent more, is basically 80, 90 percent better than a traditional tower when we talk about drift emissions. We're not going to have the droplets on the side of the tower like a traditional tower. So at that point, then the host breathe it in, and then oftentimes Legionella is not even accurately uh, detected, and it's sometimes thought of being a different illness. Okay, but I'm not a Legionella expert on, from from an, from an illness standpoint. I'm just trying to tell you how does a cooling tower affect it, and how can we improve upon it. So, a conventional approach is obviously to clean the cooling tower quarterly, which I think in our in what we've seen uh, when we talk to end users that rarely happens. The Tower Tech Tower, we can do it annually. The conventional system, they use basin sweeper systems, okay, which requires more nozzles. So a traditional nozzle, one of the pain points in the cooling tower is that those nozzles clog. Well, now all of a sudden I have a, a nozzle that's clogs, and now I'm entering more nozzles in basin sweepers. So I'm entering into a more of a maintenance item when I do a basin sweeper system on a conventional approach. The tower tech approach is we basically have a self-cleaning basin. It's a high-velocity system, again, uh, so we don't need a basin sweeper system that, that they do. Uh, filtration systems, which are good, and then again, our drift rate is 0004, where their drift rate is 0.001 to 0.002, where you'll feel the water droplets. So when we first started doing training on this last year, um, kind of pulled up a couple studies, and one of the things is you saw in Quebec, Quebec City, uh, they had 13 people killed uh, by Legionnaires' disease, uh, Legionnaires disease um, in, uh, in, in, that, uh, in Quebec City. And then you pull up different articles from August of 2013 of all the different Legionnaires' disease uh, articles that pop up on Google. And one of the big things is what they're doing is they're coming after they're coming after the contractor. They're coming after the engineer who designed the system. So one of the main things when we look at Le uh, like a cooling tower system, at the very least you want to make sure you, if you're going to specify a conventional tower, is you use a, a, a basin sweeper system. Um, and then, or a cooling tech, a tower tech tower, which actually has a high velocity basin. So let's go to question two, Ryan. 
All right, question number two on the screen now. Which cooling tower construction materials typically have the longest life expectancy? Choices are galvanized, uh, reinforced polymer, stainless steel, wood, or fiber reinforced cardboard, one of my favorites. And we have some comedians in the audience, apparently. While we're waiting for everybody to answer, uh, just so you guys know, if you didn't, if you weren't aware, down in the bottom question slash chat box down there, if you have questions you want to ask us uh, about cooling towers or at least HVAC in general, you guys can type those in. And then on one of the breaks or at the end, uh, we'll we'll go through those and, and answer any questions that you guys sent in. All right, regarding the poll question, I'm going to go ahead and close it now. It looks like 89% of the people voted, so we'll give it five seconds. All right, we'll close it. We'll post the results up here for everybody. So you guys did awesome. 87% of the people had the correct answer with protruded fiber reinforced polymer. Uh, and I do appreciate you guys that voted for the cardboard. That's a, a good construction material there. All right, so we're going we're gonna to go on to overall system efficiency, and we're going to talk about some of the advantages of tower tech and why it, uh, it is more efficient than the, than the traditional towers. So we're going to look at, again, total installed fan horsepower. Um, we're going to look at the minimum fan frequency allowed, fan motor frequency allowed with the VFD. So this is a big one because when we look at a gear-driven VFD, it has a minimum frequency of 25 hertz, whereas the tower tech design, we're, getting, we're using multiple fans, right? So the multiple fans, it's a direct drive fan. We have a minimum frequency of 6 hertz on that fan motor. So we could run it down a little further. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is the pump head, the distance to basically pump the water from the, to the top of the nozzles, the pump head, and then uh, the variable flow turndown capability while efficiently covering all fill media in the cell. Now this is a big one, and this is one of the big pieces of tower tech and why the advantage of using a tower tech. So if we look at a traditional tower nozzle, and these are the nozzles that the big criteria, the big issue with a traditional nozzle is it clogs, right? So it clogs, and then once it clogs, it doesn't basically coat the fill as effectively as, uh, as, as it once used to when it was a brand new nozzle. So that nozzle has a certain area that it covers in the fill, dictate, dict, as you see in the picture. So as I reduce the flow through that nozzle, and per the O&Ms, you'll see this, if I, if I reduce it less than 85%, then it coats less fill. So as that water is covering the fill, air is going to cover the path of least resistance. So it's going to go through the part of the fill that isn't coated with water. And that is what we call, sometimes they call drier disease, or we get, so we have water on it, then we basically have air, so we have higher scaling in that area of, of the cooling tower. And overall, the tower is not acting as efficient. So the way a cooling tower is, uh, it, how, how a cooling tower works is I need as much surface area of that fill covered with water. And if I could reduce, if I could figure out how I can reduce the amount of water used and still cover the whole surface area properly, then I have a really efficient cooling tower. And that's really what we're talking about with tower tech. So the tower tech design, we have a four inch inlet okay, to that. So you'll see, if you look in the picture there, the water enters in there, and it's actually like a water bearing. So the higher the flow, then actually opens up that, that bearing, and then that water flows evenly through the whole pattern of, the, uh, of that cell and coats the whole cell. So that nozzle can vary flow from 100 GPM to 300 GPM. So we have a one-third turndown on our nozzle while still coating the whole area of the cooling uh, of the fill area. So when we look at variable flow and we look at a conventional tower versus a tower tech tower, so a conventional tower, what they use is they use a weir system. Okay? So I have I have the water that flows in the top, and as the water reaches a certain level, it co it goes over all the weirs and I have all that area then covered, the, the fill is all covered at hundred percent flow. When we go to fifty percent flow, however, there's a certain area that's not in use, okay? So when you, you look at, like we call it the liquid to gas ratio, the air to water ratio of the system itself. 
So they really have, they have half the water, but they only have half the surface area also. So yes, they're saving in pump energy, but their, their tower is not really getting that much more efficient because we're not coating more surface area with less, with, with less water. Whereas we look at a tower tech variable flow system, at 100% flow, we're coating the whole tower. And then when we go down to 50% flow, we're again utilizing the, the same area, so we have more surface area covered with less water. So now I have fans that can turn down to 6 hertz versus 25 hertz, and I have more surface area that I can cover in the tower. That's where I'm getting the efficiency benefits of the tower tech tower versus the traditional tower. So I guess in half the water loading, twice the surface area. I have a better LGG ratio than a, than a traditional tower is at, half, at, 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 part flow, at, part, at part load. And how often are we in part load? In this market, we're in part load an awful lot of times. Again, you can see the, the drawing of the, the, the nozzle simulating uh, where the water is coming through the nozzle. And it's, and it's an anti-clogging nozzle. Okay, so that nozzle is, uh, you, could put, you could put a bunch of junk in there. That water is just, it, all the junk is going to get dispersed out of that nozzle. So it's like an anti-clogging nozzle because it's got a four inch inlet versus the traditional nozzle, which is about a half inch inlet. Question three, Ryan. All right, question three. All right, I'm going to launch it right now. The question is, which disease is commonly associated with cooling towers? Choices are West Nile, Legionnaires, Influenza or plantar fasciitis. Hey Mike, while we're waiting, look at the question box. There's a couple questions on there, I think, for you. Scroll down to the bottom of the list. Okay. I don't know if we can answer them now or if we can save them to the end. It's either way. Okay, here I'm gonna let me just so we're doing pretty good. Ninety one percent of the people voted. We'll give it another ten seconds here. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, share the results with you guys. So you guys are good on that one. 97% uh, of you said Legionnaires, and that is correct. Uh, it's extremely commonly associated with cooling towers, almost to our industry's uh, detriment, if you will. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself and, uh, and turn things back over to Mike here. Okay, so, okay, at... Uh at six hertz, do the do the motors overheat? Yeah, it's basically a, you know, every every, um, it's just got a certain minimum frequency to to it. So uh, the motor man, I'm basically going on the motor manufacturer frequency. I'm not a motor expert. I just know what our motor can go down to, which is six hertz. I, the 25 hertz limitation on a gearbox is basically due to the oil the oil and the uh, and the overheating of that uh, motor itself. Yeah, and so six hertz is still 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 ten percent, so it's still it's still quite a bit. A lot of people have an old check figure in their head of of twenty percent as a minimum VFD speed, and that's just a check figure that's always safe. If you know the details of the individual fan or pump, which in this case we do, we can we can be you know less conservative with the answer and, and have a more true answer for a specific application. So ten percent in this case. So let's look at a, uh, an efficiency comparison versus Tower Tech versus a competitor. So in this case, we have a 2,700 ton, 2700 ton chiller plant um, where the design is 8,100 GPM, 9585 utilizing a 78 degree wet bulb uh, for sizing the cooling towers. We, we're going to have three 900 ton chillers with three 2,700 uh, GPM pumps. We're going to have seven months of operation. 10% of the hours are going to be at 2,700 tons, 45% of the hours are going to be at 1,800 tons, and then 45% of the hours are going to be at 900 tons in the system itself. So we're going to have a comparison, which is we're going to compare ourselves to the most popular fixed orifice tower. Okay? They're going to use three 900 ton cells. They're going to have 60 horsepower per cell or a total of 180 total horsepower. Again, they have a minimum, and actually that's a, that's a misprint, but it's, a, it's actually a 20, 25 is, or 20 hertz. Ryan said 20%, but he's got a 20 hertz, 19 feet of pump head, and then the Tower Tech cooling tower is going to be, again, three 900 ton cells, the same installed horsepower of 180 horsepower, and then we have a minimum VFD frequency of 6 hertz, but we have a pump savings because we have, a, we have a, our, our nozzle distribution system 
It utilizes less pump head than traditional cooling towers do, so it's got 13 feet of pump head versus a, a traditional cooling tower. And in order to do the analysis, we're going to use uh, pump horsepower is going to be equated by using the flow feet of head, the constant 3960, and then pump efficiency. So when we look at design day 8100 GPM, 8595, 78 degree wet bulb, uh, the top shows the traditional tower system and the bottom shows the tower tech tower system. The fan horsepower is going to be the same, 180 horsepower. The pump horsepower on the traditional system is 46 and the pump head on the tower tech tower system is 31. Okay, So a total horsepower of 211 versus 226. So on a design day, we're saving about 15 horsepower or 7% energy savings. Not that big of a deal. But how often are we there, really? So we're, we're offering the major, operating the majority of the hours at, uh, at, uh, at part load. So let's look at 1,800 tons, okay? 5,400 GPM, 8,595, 65-degree wet, wet bulb. And in this case, because on a traditional tower system, their orifice or their flow nozzles can only reduce flow up to 85%. So really, when, when I turn off a chiller, I have to turn off a cell of the tower also. Okay, so as I turn off a chiller, I turn off a tower cell. That's, how, that's basically how, how a traditional tower system works. Whereas the tower tech tower system, and the energy benefit of it is, as I turn off that chiller, I then cover all the fill of those three towers with flow used on the two chillers. So for my fan horsepower savings, I go from on the traditional tower system, it's 120 horsepower. The pump head, 31. For the tower tech, it's 48 fan horsepower, 21 pump horsepower, or 151 versus 69, which equates to 54% energy savings, or 82 horsepower saved at that situation. Let's look at this 900 ton chiller plant at 45% at, uh, at of the operating hours. Again, 2,700 GPM. 75, 65, 50 degree, 50, 50 degree wet bulb. Again, one chiller on the competitor, one tower on fan horsepower 60, pump horsepower 16, total horsepower, horsepower 76. The tower tech solution, again, there's a certain point. That nozzle can only vary the flow down to 100 GPM. So there is going to be a point where I, I'm going to have to shut off one of the cells. In this case, I'm shutting off one of the cells, but I'm pumping the, the water from one chiller on the condenser side across two cells. So now I'm able to reduce my frequency of the direct drive motor further. So I'm, I'm driving that, I'm driving that, I'm saving fan energy, a lot of that's fan energy, 20 horsepower versus 60, and then my pump head is 11 versus 16. So I total, total horsepower is 31 versus 76 or 59% energy savings, 45 horsepower saved. So when we look at the whole analysis, and we have a conventional tower looking at 19 feet of pump head and fixed nozzles versus the tower tech design with 13 feet of head and variable flow nozzles, we have an overall KW savings of 48% versus a traditional tower. Now, this is, this is exactly how uh, the... Um, Christ Hospital project was was analyzed and showed them a two to three year payback on the on the tower system itself, and this is how we're doing in a lot of situations. So, and we have some software that we can do it. We'll discuss here in a bit. Um, we talk about maintenance and reliability. So, a conventional tower system versus a tower tech. So, how often do I clean the strangers strainers monthly? Nozzles. A conventional tower you're supposed to supposed to clean a monthly. On a tower tech, you're supposed to inspect them semi-annually, which you rarely ever do because they're non-clocking. Cold water basin, quarterly, annually for tower tech. Air inlet louvers, water collection system, monthly, annually for us. Fill media, semi-annually for the conventional, annually for us. And this is in their own app, so this is the stuff we're making up. Uh, clean fan motor exterior, quarterly for them, annually for us. And everything else has to do with shaft bearings, checking oil level, changing oils. We don't require it because we're a direct drive motor. Okay, so that's a big thing. And then if you look in the far right corner, what is the impact if I have a mechanical failure? So the traditional tower tech tower, it has multiple fans. So in that case where we had a three 900 cell tower, okay, if we lose one of those fans, 
we still have 99% available performance on that tower system versus the conventional system. If they lose one of those fans, they have only a, they, they basically have two towers left of the three. So they have 67% uh, available performance for that system. Whereas the Tower Tech Tower, if one fan fails, we still have a bunch of other fans that can, can handle it. And we have 99% uh, uh, available performance for the system. So when we look at the specification checklist, in order to have a tower, to, a tower that actually sustains you know, a long life, uh, what you want to look at doing is uh, you know, 15 year structural warranty protruded fiber reinforced polymer or stainless steel you know that's that's one of the things if you want to use a traditional tower we recommend saying at least do stainless steel okay um, and then do a non prorated parts and labor warranty with that machine um, bottom mounted fans so that they're easy accessible easily accessible so uh, a tower tech tower fan what you're doing is you have the bottom of you could change out that tower fan with two people so you let down the screen and then you could basically service and change out that fan with two people fairly easily. You don't have to climb up on a ladder and get up to the top of it and use the davit arms. All right? Whereas if you're going to use a traditional tower, I would recommend using full safety handrails, laders, ladders, and davit cranes. And then the other thing is high velocity flow through basins or basin sweepers. I believe basin sweepers are now, are, are now uh, required for hospitals. So anybody who's designing a hospital, a basin sweeper, if you're going to use a traditional tower, that's what you have to do. Otherwise, a tower tech tower has that built in. And then also look at the oper operational cost evaluation of the three-year payback. Question four, Ryan. All right, here we go. Question number four, launching. Uh, so what are two major reasons the tower tech tower cooling tower saves energy versus a traditional tower system? So in this case, you're checking two boxes. Even though it says select one, why does it say that? Hmm, apparently programmatically made an error there. All right, well, if you pick either one of the two, then we'll count it as correct. Sorry about that. I should have changed the question type. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds. We got 75% people voted. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And we'll put the results up. All right, so you guys did great. Um, either one of the correct answers would have been variable flow nozzle that varies the flow or direct drive fans that allow you to reduce the, uh, the speed down to 6 hertz. So both of those answers are correct. Uh, I just clicked the wrong uh, question type. It should have given you the ability to answer multiple times, but I, I checked the wrong one. So both of those are right. So if you guys are getting PDHs, if you answered either one of those, it'll be counted as being correct. All right, Mike. Okay, so let's look at an example problem. This is a school project we were working on. It's a two 400-ton tower replacement. <clears throat> 85 entering condenser water temperature, 3 GPM per ton. Uh, 78 degree wet bulb. Owner wants to replace two towers. Originally oversized chiller, so he's got two 400 ton chillers in there, but he's actually got a 450 ton design day load. So that second chiller very rarely runs on that system itself. Okay, uh, but he's so it's only running at the peak. Um, when we do our quick comparison, a 400 ton tower comparison, it's quantity two. <coughs> We have, uh, we're comparing ourselves versus one of our competitors' cross-flow towers. So the total installed horsepower, so if you look on paper, we had 36 horsepower installed, where they're looking at 30 horsepower total installed, okay? So on paper, if you did the old analysis, they look like they may be more efficient, okay? We have a quantity of 12 3 horsepower fans, where they're doing a quantity 2 15 horsepower fans, okay? Our minimum frequency is 6 hertz, theirs is 25. Our capacity modulation is pretty much infinite from 200 to 400 GPM. They have four steps because they're using that weir system, so their flow can drop in half, so 800, 700, 400, 200. Life expectancy, 35 years for us. Uh, life expectancy th for them is about 20 years. Uh, warranty structural, we're a 15-year parts and labor warranty. There are five-year parts only. 
Variable flow nozzle, again, yes, we vary it from 300 to 100 GPM. The competitors don't. And then increased cycles of concentration. This is a big one because it allows us to save, down, save on the blowdown, the water consumption from blowdown and cycles of concentration when the uh, solids in the water increase. So traditionally, we're about 50% better than the competitors. So we're at four and a half cycles of concentration versus, versus our competitor, which is three. So let's look at the example software. And this is what's unique what, right now with the Tower Tech, and that is they have a software package which is called PACE. It analyzes uh, towers, can, compares the Tower Tech tower versus the manufactured data that they have for other competitors, like the other Marley's BACs uh, out there. So we compare it using their own product data and literature of their performance data. So we're, we're comparing head-to-head -head versus them when we're looking at towers. So in this case, we have a 2400 GPM design load, 85, 95, 78. We're assuming electrical cost of 10 cents a kilowatt hour, sewer disposal of $2, $2 per thousand gallons, and water cost $2 per thousand gallons. So when we look at the annual energy consumption of the Tower Tech Tower versus the opposition, the fan energy, their, their peak energy is going to be 39,000 uh, versus ours, which is 32,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, uh, the pump energy of the tower is 22,000 versus 54,000 versus them. And then the annual water consumption. Our evaporation rate, they're all going to be fairly simple, our tower versus their tower. So we're slightly less, but it's very similar. Our drift rate, you'll see that it's 2 gallons per thousand, where they're 54 gallons per thousand. This is the tiny driplets that, uh, that are on the side of the tower when you walk by a traditional cooling tower. And our blowdown is going to be 332 versus 623. Because we have high, higher cycles of concentration, we can use that water about 50% more than a traditional tower can uh, on the system. And then we look at the annual operating cost. So we got the fan energy, so they're around 39 versus 32 for us. Pump energy, water consumption, sewer, chemical, total tower. And then we look at the overall annual energy operating savings. We're saving about $6,000 per year over an op 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 opposing tower. So when we look at a traditional tower tech tower, and the tower tech tower is going to be more expensive than a traditional tower. Okay, so in this case, it was 155,000 versus a competitor's, which is 143,000. Again, we had an annual operating cost of 9,600 9, versus 15,900, and we had a payback of about two-year period. So we were successful in winning this job based on a two-year period uh, for this project, um, and the end user was pretty happy. So, and what we're using is we're using this PACE software. In the PACE software, what we do is we enter in the operating characteristics of a typical tower. Uh, we then go in and we enter in all the criteria, comfort cooling, the application, where it's located. Um, this is just screenshots from the program itself, so I want you to show you where we generated this program at. And then we enter in, we use the wet bulb, we, we either calculate it with average wet bulb or the highest wet bulb in that area looking at past weather data. Uh, and then we look at the tower. This is a bit of an eye chart on the screen, but what we do is we put loading factors in different in the operating hours of that uh, building. So we're trying to get that tower, we're trying to get that building, and we're trying to figure out where it operates and, and the tonnage at which at what time of the year. So we're building like this little database uh, for this uh, for this application. Um, and then we put in the unit prices. So what are the unit prices for chemical usage? Uh, electrical usage, sewer, water, we're plugging that into the program. We're looking at our opposition's tower and their base cost along with all the different, you know, the horsepower minimum pump head that they require. Um, and we're, all this data is in the program itself. And then we're doing the head-to-head -head comparison, cycles of concentration versus the competitors. And then at that point we're coming up with our, uh, our spreadsheet which is what I kind of showed you in the summary where we're showing the payback period uh, of that cooling tower and we can get you energy analysis, we can get you prints, and we can show you to generate the reports, viewing supporting data, and review charts. So it's a, it's a very powerful tool and it allows us to now sell or allow an, uh, a, an engineer or an owner to look at payback and look at and analyze the, the true efficiency of a cooling tower, not total horsepower or footprint or what the overall lowest cost of that tower is. It's 
trying to figure out how what the you know if I can get a tower now that lasts 35 years and it runs more efficiently and has less maintenance and I I eliminate a lot of things like Legionnaires disease uh, Legionnaires disease and um, and other things that cause end user headaches that's a very very big thing so um, I believe that is it so what we did is we learned a little bit about the tower tech tower common issues best practices key factors and energy efficiency and realizing that we have the tools to help uh, the return on investment uh, calculations on uh, for, for evaluating cooling towers I think that's it so any questions out there and I can start scanning through the question there list is here. another question on there for you Mike and while we're doing that I'll launch the, uh, the final poll question so you can uh, rate how useful this uh, webinar was for you guys today. So the question is, doesn't fans at the bottom have more potential of drawing dirt from the floor than a conventional side air inlet? So if you look at a traditional side air inlet, when it's mounted, when it's on the ground, that side air inlet is right at the bottom of the ground, uh, right at the floor level. Okay, or sometimes it's on on the on the side, but it's it's running at a, at a at a low velocity up through the fan system, but then it goes into the water collection system. So um, the actual answer is no, it's not. Uh, we, we're typically operating on a eight foot leg, so uh, that dirt has it's very tough for that dirt to to basically get to the bottom of the fan. Now there will be some dirt that gets in there, but it's going to be less to a less extent than a traditional tower. If you look at the traditional tower, you have the big louvers on the side, uh, and then you have the exposed water to the outside air. So when you look at a tower, so next time you look at it, you can take a look at it. So, um, let's see what else. I think that might be all the questions. Anybody else have any other questions they want to send in? We'll uh, we'll hang out for three or four more minutes to see if anybody types anything else in here. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for uh, staying on the webinar. If you have any questions, um, is my contact information on the invite, Ryan, or not? Uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it on here right now, too. So everybody can just click on it if they want to. So if they want to contact me directly to discuss projects or if anything you, it comes to mind or if anything come, questions come up afterwards, you can contact me, uh, Mike Smid, mike.smid at tecmungo.com. Um, but again, thank you very much. It's in the chat box too, so you can just click on it if you want. So again, uh, I got another question here. Is um, we typically list three manufacturers in the spec. Uh, who is your competitor? We could actually, you could show the other competitors in there. What what we view is at that point, if you're going to put a cooling to tower tech tower versus a competitor's tower, you should you should make sure they're on equal footing, right? So. Make sure they're specifying all stainless steel, that they have all the uh, requirements to service that top-mounted fan um, by using David, David arms. So all stainless steel, David arms, that makes us very comparable at that point. They're not going to get the true advantage of the variable flow nozzle. But you could put Tower Tech along with the other manufacturers in there, but those other manufacturers need to put you know, the base and sweeper stainless steel towers. So, so basically make it more uh, of a performance-based spec if you could. That's, that's exactly. probably what you want to happen. You want this tower not to corrode for X amount of years, so pick the materials that you could do that with. Um, why is the cooling tower tons 15,000 instead of 12,000? That's because I have uh, basically my com um, I have my compression inefficiencies, which are in entering into that that uh, that 15,000. You have a we have a performance spec. We do have a performance spec that allows us to do a level playing field. So uh, I think that is uh, yes. We do have a we definitely have a, a spec a performance spec that allow you to say listen I'm going to put all three menu all four manufacturers in it and we'll put we'll try to put everybody to as much of a level playing field as possible. They're going to be bidding stainless steel. We're going to be bidding through the fiberglass. So, so we'll, we'll send you that back, Andrew. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is also is uh, if you go to Tower Tech's website, um, 
there's very few times when you actually have end users that brag about their cooling towers. Okay, and here you'll if you go to the website, they'll see uh, Mike Bayless from Northwestern Community Hospital, uh, which will be in there, and and he'll talk about why he uses Tower Tech cooling towers versus the competitors and the advantages of it, and how he uses less chemical treatment, cleans his condenser tubes less. So, and that stuff coming from an end user, uh, that's a that, that's one of the key things when you go to go to Tower Tech website and go to testimonials. And that's very, very powerful stuff when you see end users actually saying good things about their cooling towers. Because most of the time what happens is that the end user doesn't say anything good about his cooling tower. In fact, he hates his cooling tower. Okay. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, for Andrew said, maintenance on many more small fans versus few larger fans seems like there will be more maintenance than, than, than less. Um, I guess you could look at it and say, you know, you have more of anything is sometimes, sometimes more is, is not as good, right? But I think in this case, you're fun, you're, you have a direct drive fan that doesn't have the failure mechanisms of a typical gear driven fan. And, um, you know, I was, I was out at uh, Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, and they have a couple of cooling to tower tech towers out there. They had the first couple first gen towers out there. <clears throat> they were, uh, those towers were 16 years old. They looked brand new. I talked to the folks there and I asked him, he had a couple of, uh, he had a couple of eight fan tower systems out there. And on those eight fan tower systems, he had one failure of a, a, of a fan motor that occurred in the 16 years as he was out there. So, uh, it, it does, you know, obviously from a probability standpoint, having more is worse than sometimes having less, but because the failure mechanisms is not there, I don't have the condensate on that, you know, on that, uh, on the, on the, uh, the, the water is going to be, you know, over, over, going over that fan, over that motor system, right? So that's one of the reasons why it is more efficient. And other thing is because I have more of them, what I'm doing is if one fails, it's not an emergency. If I have a traditional tower and if I have one tower fan, if I have one motor that fails, well, like our example, then I only have two cells operational. Whereas the tower tech tower, I could schedule a non-emergency fix, maybe even in the off season, right? So that's the other advantage to having the multiple towers, multiple fans on it. Uh, da, da, da. Is there any, any drawback for this type of arrangement where the fan are on the bottom of the system. Um, I, I think it's a, uh, I, it, I, I'm going to say no, okay, and the reason I think it's, it's a good idea is because I could, uh, I don't have to climb on ladders to maintain the fans on the bottom of the system, right? And uh, so all my mechanicals are outside of the airstream. That's a really big thing uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a fan, on a tower system. All right, and that's pretty much all the questions. Uh, if anybody has any other future questions, Mike's uh, email and phone number are on the, uh, the chat box there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end today's recording. Uh, if you qualify for PDHs and you are a professional engineer, we will be sending you those certificates within the week. Um, and we thank you guys for attending. Next week's topic is uh, Internet Thermostat Comparison. Uh, it should be a pretty good topic. Uh, Greg Dutris and myself will be hosting that one. Uh, that one is not a PDH one, uh, but it should be a good topic nonetheless. If you want to learn more about internet thermostats, and specifically we're going to compare a bunch of different ones from different manufacturers, um, you know, contrast them. So join us for that. If you, uh, if you didn't already get an email on that, let me know, and I'll make sure you get the invitation for that this week. Thank you.